<laughs> I am Emily Freeman. I lead developer relations at a company called Kickbox. Our API is a better, smarter reCAPTCHA that ensures your users are real people with legitimate email addresses. I'm thrilled to be here with you all in Amsterdam. It's my first time here. Yeah. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> Scaling systems is hard, but we're engineers. That's kind of our thing. Scaling people, well, that's significantly harder. Humans are complicated. Broadly speaking, companies have three stages of development. Infancy, those awkward teenage years, and if they survive the trials of adolescence, adulthood. An infant startup is so drastically different from its adult incarnation that they could be considered different companies. Each will have a unique mission and culture. Scaling isn't just about making what you have bigger. An ant can't be scaled to the size of an elephant because the internal structure is fundamentally different. Instead, companies have to evolve. But companies aren't living, breathing organisms. They're collections of people, families, tribes, civilizations. So how do you scale a team of two to 20 to 200? Well, I think the answer lies 2,000 years ago in Sparta. This talk is going to focus on three distinct military organizations, the Spartans, the Mongols, and the Romans. Sparta's standing army numbered about 10,000. It was relatively small, whereas Rome's peaked at nearly half a million. We'll look at the organization of each military, what they prioritized, how they treated their soldiers, and then take those lessons learned and apply it to our own teams and organizations. And if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not a manager, I don't ever wanna manage, I don't need to worry about this, I would challenge you to reevaluate that. Not all leaders are managers, and I think you'd be surprised how many people in your organization look to you for guidance. No one owns your career, your job satisfaction, but you. If you think your job, your team, your company can be better, it's up to you to serve as an example of the change you want to see. And if your company culture is one in which pull requests are not accepted, it might be time to change your gig. Scaling an army of soldiers or engineers comes down to communication and collaboration. How do you keep people informed and moving together toward a shared goal? If there's just a few folks, it's really no big deal, right? You're probably all in the same room, you know each other really well, you can just yell at each other when you have questions, you probably have the entire code base and infrastructure mapped in your own head because you probably built it. But as your team grows, more and more intersections of communication develop. And with that, more opportunities for miscommunication. There's actually a formula for this. I shouldn't be surprised. Don't worry, I'll spare you the math. For a team of five, there are 10 connections. That's not so bad. A team of 10 jumps to 45. A team of 20 brings us to 190 connections. And what about a team of 100 developers? Anyone have a guess? Over 9,000. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Thank God. 4,950. Nearly 5,000 ways your team can communicate with one another. Is anyone else totally overwhelmed by that number? Because I am. I feel like this adorable yet definitely melancholy pug. I love that pug, it's just so cute. Before I continue, I want to acknowledge that scaling is messy and it always will be messy. We don't live in a vacuum. There's no Petri dish in which to try different approaches and see what works. Often, due to resource constraints, we get one shot and if we fail, well, that's it, game over. But there are some things that we can do better as managers and as engineers. So where do we start? Well, I think we start with Sparta, our startup of the ancient world. They were small. At its largest, the standing army numbered about 10,000. 
And Sparta was obsessed with what it did best, war. They also had a thing with nudity, but this conference has a code of conduct, uh, so I'm not gonna dig into that. <laughs> Most Greek city-states were fortified by a wall. Instead, Sparta chose to defend themselves with a wall of men. That's bold. Their obsession with war started on day one. Newborns were taken to the Gereza, a council of elders for inspection. Infanticide, unfortunately, was common in all of Greece, and Sparta was no exception. Babies who were not deemed fit enough, strong enough, were abandoned and left to die of exposure. At age seven, boys were taken to the Agosh, a military training facility and barracks. Girls were permitted to stay with their parents. They were educated and encouraged to exercise. So yay for kind of equal rights. We're getting there. Spartans issued all comforts. They're the only people for whom war was said to be a reprieve from everyday life. Their staple diet consisted of blood broth, exactly what it sounds like, terrible. And boys at the Agosh were regularly denied food and clothing. They were encouraged to steal, but beaten harshly if caught. Not for stealing, but for being caught. Everything about the Agosh hardened these boys for war. At age 12, they hit their first real test. They were sent out with only a red cloak and expected to survive. At age 20, soldiers joined a sisitia, which was a sort of mess or club. Spartan peers and members of the club had to accept men into the group, and voting had to be unanimous. If a Spartan had not been accepted into a sisitia, by the age of 30, he would fail to become a citizen and instead occupy a lower standing. Men were permitted to marry from 20 on, but would remain in the barracks away from their wives and children until age 30. They would continue to serve as reservists until age 60, which makes our retirement age seem generally fair. All Spartans were equal to their peers and submissive to the unit. A soldier who lost his hoplon or shield was disgraced because the shield protected not only that man, but the man on his left. Spartans were a small tribe of intensely loyal, overworked, and sometimes underfed soldiers who bravely took on the big boys of the ancient world. The Battle of Thermopylae pitted 300 Spartans, 700 Thespians, 400 Thebans against, supposedly, 100,000 Persians. And isn't that how every startup would like to imagine themselves? Maybe without the core strength and rugged good looks? When you're in that startup phase, I want you to find what you do best. Spartans were unmatched in war. If an ally were threatened, all they had to do was send one man, a single Spartan in that iconic red cloak. Because enemies knew that a war with one Spartan was a war with all of Sparta. You're too young to be worried about anything but product market fit. Stay focused. Hire generalists. You need people capable of solving just about any problem. Spartans didn't have special forces. Every soldier knew how to do everything. They followed the same strategies, treated each other as equals. The people you need may not be up to date on the latest and greatest frameworks, but they have a certain grit, a resilience, and a dogged determination to figure it out. At this stage, specialists could hinder progress by narrowing their focus too quickly. Keep your team agile and focus on how to solve the problem most effectively, not how to solve it using a specific tool. Allow natural communication pathways to form. A desire path is a path created through grass, typically, by humans or animals walking over the same piece of land over and over and over again. And communication follows a similar pattern. Some of us are better at it than others. So observe who communicates with others most seamlessly. And if you need to delegate responsibility or bring something to the group, maybe explain it to that person first and have them take it to everyone else. Take on the big boys. Listen, when you have two developers and three to six months of runway, all the statistics 
say that you are going to crash and burn. So might as well make it spectacular. 300 Spartans marched right up to 100,000 Persians and challenged them to a fight. Be bold. Worst case, you learn some valuable lessons. Best case, you become the big boy. The Mongols are by far my favorite of these militaries. They're absolutely fascinating. And they serve as our analog for a mid-sized team. You can consider it our awkward teenager of an organization. The Mongol army topped out at about 100,000. It is to this day the largest geographic empire in history. They conquered nearly all of continental Asia, the Middle East, and parts of Europe. No one expected Mongols to have influenced history in the way that they did. As a people, they sat quietly in the foothills of Siberia, mastering archery and horsemanship. And like all people who live in brutal conditions, they were tough, like real tough. The Mongols and their conquests are forever married to Genghis Khan, or Chinggis, depending on whom you ask. Timogen, the boy who would become Genghis Khan, was born to a lowly and unremarkable tribe in 1162. His father was poisoned, and he was left to the care of his older brothers, one of whom he actually murdered in a fight. So those family reunions must have been pretty fun. <laughs> As a teenager, he married Borta, his first and most influential wife. Early in their marriage, she was kidnapped, which was an actually, actually a common practice in Mongolia at the time. Uh, and his rescue of her proved his military medal. He went on to unite the Mongol tribes by instigating a brutal civil war and was eventually named Great Khan, ruling over all of Mongolia. Genghis was a brilliant military leader. Under his rule, Mongols conquered more land in 25 years than the Romans did in 400. He did this through a number of tactics. Mongols embraced religious tolerance. Conquered people could practice their religions freely. He promoted people on merit and often brought people from lower classes into his tribe while doing away with the rich and powerful families. This made him extremely popular. Mongol society was pretty egalitarian. Both men and women contributed, and women didn't suffer from the typical patriarchal oppression you see in other cultures of the time, minus the whole wife kidnapping thing. I haven't figured that one out yet. The Mongols were uncommonly adaptable. Even though they had no experience with walled cities, they mastered siege warfare. Cities were often so afraid of slaughter that as soon as the Mongols showed up, they would surrender. Mongols defeated nations that had 100 times the manpower, which is kind of what a mid-sized company needs to do. You've got that product market fit. Now it's time to build your empire. So how do we apply Genghis Khan's wisdom to our own teams? First, avoid emotional decision making. Above all else, Genghis Khan was a master strategist. In the early days, things are rocky. One day you land a client that pays this month's entire AWS bill, and the next, the site's down and people are just calling just to scream at you. Reactionary businesses rarely survive. So I want you to start to think in an OODA loop. And if you're unfamiliar, that's not just a fun English word to say, though it is fun to say, OODA. It's actually created by Colonel John Boyd of the US Air Force, and it stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. This will allow you to rapidly work through problems and prevent yourself from being bogged down by fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's even better if you can get inside your competition's OODA loop and upend their strategy. Avoid micromanagement. Mongol officers and troops were given significant freedom by their superiors in executing orders. As long as the larger objectives were met, Mongol soldiers could solve problems as they saw fit. In other words, they focused on what, not how. As you grow, you want to keep your team focused on the larger mission, whatever that is, but give them room to do their job. Enable autonomy. Each Mongol soldier typically maintained three to four horses. They swapped their horses frequently, which allowed them to ride for days without swapping or exhausting their animals. 
they had an extraordinary ability to live off the land, and in extreme conditions, they could actually live off their horses, mainly through mare's milk. Unlike other armies, they weren't dependent on supply logistics. Give your employees the resources they need to get the job done. Support them, and if you happen to be in a management position, protect them. If a VP of product wants the feature done yesterday, that's your problem. Now's that time to embrace your inner Genghis Khan and start yelling at executives. I'm kidding, that's terrible, terrible advice, don't do that. <laughs> Stay small. Much like our modern military, the Mongol army was organized into small squads that together made up larger units. Instead, embrace those small groups, those close-knit, family-like structures of people that can merge into larger groups when necessary. Start to introduce the structure, but keep it simple. Don't go full in on JIRA and hire a scrum master just yet. Instead, implement a daily stand-up. Start tracking features and bugs on a whiteboard or via little sticky notes. Who was the fan of Post-it notes yesterday? Simple tracking tool is best at this point. At this stage, too much co communication is inefficient, and too little will result in confusion. The last thing you want is two developers working on the same bug. I have fixed those merge conflicts. Zero out of 10 would not recommend. <laughs> Prevent yourself from falling into the trap of acting like a real company, whatever that means to you. I mean, yes, let's file our taxes and remain legal, um, but it's not time for a standard review process annually or mandatory one-on-ones every single week. Focus. It's easy at this stage to get excited about all the possibilities. I see a lot of founders fall into this trap. But we're smart people, we're engineers, right? And part of our job is to push back against the business side of the organization when they come up with crazy ideas. Find your one market. Focus on your most successful value add. Once you have revenue and majority market share, you can start invading other areas. For now, stay focused. If you survive the pimply, mistake-ridden years of scaling a startup into an enterprise, congratulations, you're Rome. Rome is our large-scale organization. Reliability and predictability are much more important. You're an empire now. It's more important to protect what you've built than it is to be a disruptor. Administration, management, and process, some of our least favorite words, eclipse rockstar developers and game-changing ideas. Rome was a nearly unstoppable force and one of the largest empires the world has ever seen. Its legacy continues to influence our daily life through language, law, government, architecture, religion, and more. The Roman Empire spanned over 2,000 years, and its military structure is a graduate level course in and of itself. Edward Gibbons' The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is nearly 4,000 pages long, and that's just the decline and fall. I can't possibly do it justice in the next few minutes, but I will summarize and highlight the structure of the Imperial Roman Army when it hit its peak size of 450,000 in 211 AD. Emperor Augustus, the second emperor of Rome, founded the imperial army. Prior to him, Rome motivated soldiers with grants of land and increased wealth. But as land became more scarce, they shifted toward rewarding soldiers with a set amount of denarii after their service. For citizen soldiers, this was the equivalent of 13 years salary, which is a lot like a pension, right? The imperial army was split into two groups, which you can think of very loosely as commissioned officers and enlisted soldiers. The commissioned officers were assigned to legions, heavy infantry made up of 5,000 Roman citizens each. Long-term professional soldiers served 25-year terms, and conscription, a draft, was used only in emergencies. In addition to the legions, the auxilia was established. These enlisted troops were recruited from the Peregrini, non-citizen residents. The auxilia supplied infantry, cavalry, archers, and special forces. Auxiliaries were awarded Roman citizenship 
after completing their 25-year commitment. The Army also employed New Mary, mercenaries from allied people outside of the Empire. You know these people as contractors. Organizationally, every province had legati, the legion commanders, who reported to a provincial governor. And the governors reported directly to the emperor in Rome, which is a much flatter structure than I originally imagined. While the legionaries held a higher status, they, could, they depended heavily on the axilia. Legions were entirely heavy infantry, foot soldiers, and heavy metal army. They were almost unbeatable against other infantry, but they couldn't campaign independently, just like developers would be stranded without teams like operations and QA. So what can we glean from Rome? Break into small teams. We do the same thing with our applications, right? When a class gets too big, we abstract logic away, make it smaller. The same principle applies to people. But allow those divisions to form naturally. Each unit in the Roman army had its own standard, which was a pole with a variety of decorations. The utility of it was to let a soldier know where the bulk of his unit was on the battlefield. But for many soldiers, these standards held deep meaning. They believed they represented divine spirits. They would pray to them. They united the soldiers around a common cause. Set a clear vision. Think of the small teams you just formed as little Spartas. Go back to those fundamentals and allow each team autonomy. But be clear about the broader vision. Teams without a focused goal will prioritize things they're interested in, not necessarily the things best for the company to focus on. Leadership must regularly communicate the direction the larger organization is headed and why. And the why is even more important than the what, because it lends context and clarity. Be careful about how many times you move the cheese, so to speak. It's okay to pivot the mission if the company depends on it, but changing priorities or restructuring teams every quarter will undermine your credibility as an organization. When your word means nothing, people stop listening. Become masters of logistics and planning. When you're big, logistics really matter. And this is where infrastructure and DevOps starts to play a super critical role. Romans invested heavily in an extensive and well-maintained road system. This allowed their troops to move relatively rapidly as needed. While smaller armies could forage, purchase, or steal food, Roman forces were just too large. Instead, deployed forces were regularly resupplied through a massive network of supply chains. The infrastructure is what separated Rome from its competitors, just like the work we do in operations allows your companies to grow at breakneck speeds. For modern development teams, this could probably be akin to project management, right? Agile, Scrum, extreme programming, Kanban, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you pick one, and as a team, you commit to it. If you choose Scrum, do Scrum. Not your snowflake, uh, the project manager wants one more thing added to the sprint this week <laughs> version of Scrum. The more logistical thinking you can remove from a developer's plate means the more time she has to do what she does best, engineer solutions. Invest in your employees, take care of them. This means encouraging work-life balance, something Europeans are much better at than we are. If you don't know what that is, work-life balance, start by not letting your employees work more than 40 hours a week. Emergencies happen. We know that when the site's down, uh, we may not make it home for dinner. And we know that we will occasionally be woken up at two in the morning. Those situations should be few and far between. Working around the clock and checking an email all weekend doesn't make your employees hard workers. It makes them former employees. Rome had a vested interest in the health and well-being of their soldiers. They developed sophisticated medical knowledge and practices. And for good reason, right? A sick soldier can't be depended on to campaign or defend a city. 
Having conversations about mental health and burnout are a big part of this. It's important. Anxiety and depression affect millions of us. Many of us in this room deal with some type of mental illness on a weekly, if not daily, basis. Engineering can be lonely, grueling work. We literally sit alone with a computer, punching in new commands and having it spit errors out at us. It literally yells at us when we don't code well enough. <laughs> Simply recognizing how hard your team works, acknowledging that everyone needs breaks, and promoting frequent, work-free vacations will do wonders for the longevity of your team. At this stage, it's okay to introduce specialists or allow your generalists to become specialists. As small teams form, sit down with everyone. Discuss their interests and goals, both professionally and personally, because it all feeds into it. Some of your generalists may express an interest in management. Many will not, and that's okay. Allocating team members may feel somewhat arbitrary at first, but if you allow some flexibility in the movement between teams and allow people to explore and try new things, each person will slowly find his or her niche. Finally, have honest conversations, no matter your size. Conflict can be really uncomfortable, I get it, but I think it is critical to scaling an engineering team. And in my opinion, really being a stand-up, honest human being. I thrive in an environment of a late-stage startup. That's just my style. I don't have the risk tolerance for the really early days when things are incredibly touch and go. I have a daughter, I like insurance. And I'm enough of an entrepreneur that I don't do well constrained by some of the strict rules that guide many corporations. I know that. I know that that's my preference and style. People who thrive when there are two developers and late nights and endless pots of coffee may not transition well as the company advances and grows. That's okay. Unhappy employees can quickly become poison for teams bringing everyone down. An honest conversation is the most simple and best way to make sure that each person feels content and fulfilled by their work. Some of the advice in this talk applies to you and your team, your history, some of it doesn't. You know your team best, follow your instincts, but be careful how much emotion is guiding your judgment. Collect data, whenever you can. It will keep you focused and inform decisions as you grow. Trust your employees and your colleagues. Grant them the freedom to do what they do best. Solve problems. Hire people that are happy, trustworthy, communicative, and talented. Above all else, serve as an example of someone who is fair, focused, and enthusiastic. No one wants to work for or with someone who isn't willing to roll up their sleeves and dive in when it's required. Thank you so much. Any questions for Emily? Can we just note how amazing your suit is? Has anyone said that yet? Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? It's, <laughs> it's pretty sweet. For Emily, sweet. not about suit? Questions or comments? Let's just be honest about comments. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Yeah. When, if people are trying to self-evaluate to figure out which of those three broad categories their org might fit in, can you give like a, a piece of guidance or two for how they would decide which one they are, other yeah. than going by the awesome outfits? <laughs> Fair. <laughs> um, yeah, don't show up to work in a, a Spartan cloak. That might not go over so well. Um, I think that if you're trying to figure out what you prefer, the best way is just to experiment. And you don't have to quit your job and try another one. Um, if you're at a super big com uh, corporation, maybe try being an entrepreneur, you know, really planning out a small project within your organization um, and seeing where that goes. I think side projects are another really good idea. So yeah, and talk to people. We all exist in this community together and we all have different experiences um, and work for wildly different companies. So communicate, ask questions. 
have an open space. Bridget's correct. Awesome idea. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I, I like your military team that you use, and I'm not really a history buff, but uh, for example, for the Spartans, uh, they, for example, eventually lost to the Macedonians, etc. Yeah. And the Romans, <laughs> maybe you could. No, but maybe. Don't bring up the bad no, news. No, no, but I, I don't. I don't I want to say uh, that. Uh, the, I mean, of course, they uh, eventually empires die. But I want to say is, uh, what are the things you would say that you should not do? Yeah. Basically, based on each of the three organizations, because, for example, yeah, the Spartans indeed eventually they just stopped innovating, and other people get caught up. Yeah. Uh, the Romans, they. Uh, you could probably say overextended. Mm -hmm. What would you say, don't do that in your organization if you're one of those types? Yeah, yeah. First, don't invade Asia. Um, okay. <laughs> that's clear. Awesome. I think... Russian winner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too close, too, too soon. Um, no, I think you're, you hit on it, right? They, they stopped innovating, and then I think the main theme I've seen is hubris. I think when organizations and people become so full of themselves and so confident that they feel that there's no possibility of failure, they start to make mistakes. Um, there's also like that sort of myth of the 10th man. This is not a real thing. I think it's from literature or something. Has anyone read this? There's a book. Just trust me on this. Um, <laughs> there's this concept of like the 10th man, and it's supposed to be that if nine people in a room agree, then the 10th person is supposed to disagree and serve as that devil's advocate. Um, to kind of bring up a different perspective. And so looping back to another theme is diversity and inclusion is huge for that. Because again, like we all have different perspectives and you can't outthink or outsmart diversity. You're just never gonna think that way. Does that answer it? Yeah, kind of. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll be around. Um, thank you so much, you guys are awesome. Thank you.